Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to IAC Accreditation, Exploring the Online Portal. My name is Courtney Frost, and I am the Marketing Communications Assistant here at IAC. Before we begin today, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and to let you know how you can participate in today's session. Uh, we would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions using the Q&A box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar as we will be monitoring questions throughout the presentation and we'll try to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A period. Uh, we may respond to some questions during the presentation as well. I would also like to point out a neat feature for those who wish to take notes during this presentation. Uh, when you click on the tab to the right of the slide labeled open, you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you're interested in a PDF copy of the, port of the PowerPoint, you may click on the resources icon in the lower left of the player. Uh, simply select the file name to initiate the download. Also, if you experience any technical problems during the course of this webinar, you may click on the information panel and there is also a tab labeled technical support that will list a brief FAQ along with a phone number for webinar support. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. Uh, this being said, uh, this presentation is intended to help facilities gain a better understanding of how to utilize the online accreditation portal. And, you know, I'm now going to pass this webinar over to today's speaker, Linda Howard, IAC Online Programs Coordinator. Linda? Thank you, Courtney. And thank you, everyone, for allowing me to occupy your time and attention today. Although this presentation does not provide any continuing education credit for the participants, I will provide some fundamental information and tips that each of you participating today can benefit from. The IAC Online Accreditation System, also known as the Portal, was first launched in 2007. Our nuclear division was the first modality to go live with the web-based online application. In the years following, the timeline depicts the dates of each of the other divisions or modalities that they were launched in the Portal. The most recent modality to go live was Carotid Stenning, added just June 1st of this year, and Vein Center will soon be added by the end of 2013 as well. I thought it would be helpful to many of you to use a metaphor during this exploration of the online accreditation portal. During this presentation, I will highlight different features of an online account that you may use when completing an application or maintaining your account between accreditation cycles. Take a moment to imagine the IAC online portal as our special community or neighborhood. Your facilities account would be like one house in this neighborhood. Inside the house, the kitchen or living room would relate to your account profile. And in completing and submitting an individual application questionnaire can be thought of similar to painting a bedroom in your house. During this presentation, I'm going to show you some of the tools and provide you with helpful information to get that job done. Now we have uh, our first poll. Actually, it's our second poll, but we had one earlier some of you took. So let's see um, if you can tell us what your um, best choice, which, which describes your facility or status as to why you chose to attend today's webinar. Are you getting ready to start an application? Are you currently working on an application? Is your facility mid-cycle or between application submission? Are you new to the facility or new to accreditation? Or are you just looking for some more information about the IEC process. Go ahead and uh, select your choice, click the Submit button, and Nick and, and Courtney will let us know what the results are. Please show them. <laughs> Okay, it looks okay. like a majority of people are currently working on an application and or my facility is mid-cycle or between application submissions. Um, so those are the two and main then the ones. Earlier, the earlier poll, Courtney, shows the, the job titles. Most of the people that are watching our presentation today look like they're technologists, which is really a cool thing. And we got some physicians, some administrators, and consultants. And I can't really scroll down to see what the bottom of that is, Nick. Um, they're in a group or an other type. So, 
that poll allows me to see where you are in the process, or both of those polls allow me to see what type of folks I'm talking to today and where you are in the process. For those of you who are working on a reaccreditation application or between cycles, some things you will see today may be familiar to you, or perhaps you heard some features mentioned during a reaccreditation webinar given by our directors here. In other words, You've already painted your room, but maybe you need more information or tools to maintain your account until it's time again to complete another reaccreditation application. We'll start our project today by entering the online account portal and accessing an account. To get to the login screen, you may enter the www.iacaonlineaccreditation.org URL into your browser, or find this box with the Access Your Account button on any of our IAC websites. When you go to the login screen or click the Access Your Account link, you'll see a screen similar to this one with the current news updates and Contact Us tab on the left and the login box on the right. Type into the field your unique user ID and then your password, which needs to be case sensitive. If you've forgotten or lost this information, you may click the Forgotten Password link on the bottom of the, the box there. After successfully logging in, you'll view the main screen of the account profile. If the account is new or an action item is listed, it will be listed in red on the main screen up at the top, in the white. And that's something that you would need to do first before proceeding through the application, through the, the profile section. These navigation links here appear across the top of the screen, and then the float, floating triangle in the lower right is your access to the FAQs and live chat feature. After you click that triangle, the support panel will appear giving you access to live help, FAQs, and a contact list. Later, when we show you the questionnaire, I will show you what it looks like, the tab looks like for your help in the questionnaire. The light green box at the top of every screen in the account profile is an important instructional language. If you get stuck or wonder what to do next, refer to this box for directions. The instructions explain that certain fields are required. These required fields throughout the account profile are indicated by bold lettering and a red asterisk. Also throughout the profile are these blue circles that when you mouse over them, they reveal helpful details for the associated field. They're called toolpicks. Then when you scroll down a little bit lower on the main screen of the profile, you see the testing modality section listed with the testing areas just below that. Now, before I show you some other sections and features of the account profile, take a look at the, the next poll that we have posted up there. Um, I want you to indicate which modality or division you represent at your facility. If you represent more than one modality, choose the last option that says multiple modalities. Go ahead and take a few moments. I'll take a look and see if there's any questions that maybe, um, like Jessica is asking, can you have two user IDs for one application? Yes, Jessica, that's a great question. You can have as many user IDs as you need, uh, admin users on the account. Great question. And thank you, Nick. Go ahead and post those results so we can all see those. And we've got a pretty good cross-section of, of all the different divisions. Uh, a lot of ECHO people on today. And a lot of people, we've got 52 people or about 16%, and representing multiple modalities. All right. Knowing that a number of you represent these multiple modalities, or you may be working on an accreditation together with others, performing another type of imaging at your facility, it's important to understand that an account in the online portal was designed to accommodate multiple modalities. However, just as multiple families may choose to live in one house together, those families can also choose to live separately. This is just the same way with an online account. You can maintain one account with multiple uh, imaging modalities in it, or you can choose to maintain separate accounts. So let's review some features in the account profile before we proceed to the questionnaire. In our metaphorical room project, we are gathering, preparing the components or tools to paint a room like we are preparing to complete the questionnaire. 
Adding or linking a user to an account is like giving your house keys to someone to help you with your project. Everyone who lives in the health house or is helping with the project will need access. And this goes back to Jessica's question about having multiple user IDs. Let's take a look at that. From the Manage Users list, you click the Add New User button or the Edit link adjacent to a user's name. And you can complete and update the different fields and then save my work. Go back to that slide for a minute. So you would you know, set the password, fill in the, the fields on the screen, and click Save My Work. I want you to really pay attention to your user list. We've had facilities get locked out of their account for various reasons, including changing email addresses and having the only admin user going on a cruise or leaving the organization. All accounts must have at least one admin user, but it is recommended to have several people listed and also important to keep it up to date, especially the email address because they've also been locked out before because the email address has changed and the forgotten password link is only sent to the, the current email address that's posted in the account. We'll look at the, the three sections kind of together, manage staff, manage sites, and manage equipment. Similarly to manage users, adding and editing staff, sites, or equipment is relatively straightforward. As I described before, the instructional language in the light green box provides guidance. One big difference with making staff, site, and certain equipment changes is that the IAC requires written notification of those changes. I want to emphasize when discussing these sections that when the changes or additions are made by a user, the IAC is not automatically aware of those modifications to your facility. So be sure you know what our policies are. There's links there that you can click on in the screen um, to, to view the um, information and submit the documentation that's needed. Back on the Edit Staff screen, I'm showing you the highlighted accreditation type for this staff member. What this indicates is that the physician in this multimodality account is the medical director for vascular testing, but is only an interpreting physician for the echo and CT modality. This slide shows only the upper portion of the edit staff screen, with the lower portion showing the continuing education table. On the continuing education table, you enter the course or certification exam name in the first field, the date the course was completed, and then the relevant hours are to be entered as an applicable for each modality. Again, the online portal was designed to accommodate multiple modalities, but you can have one modality and, and fill it out and complete it for just your staff in that individual modality. So this is back to the Manage Site screen. And a common mistake on under sites is to forget to check off this little acknowledgement box. Remember, the required fields on all the pages in the account profile do need to be completed. For Manage Equipment, this is what the, the Manage Equipment page looks like. And when you go down into the Equipment Details, you would fill it out as applicable. Staff sites and equipment screens, I've hi highlighted some helper tools. And I know this is a busy slide, but there's some things that I'm pointing to here that I've had people recently ask me about. What does it mean to click download active site list or download, download, um, export the equipment, download the CE information? It, it ties into another tool on, on the applications page that I'll show you, show you shortly. But this is not needed. You don't need to do anything other than enter your, your facility's information in on these pages in order to get the population on the, of the field on the application questionnaire. So for managed staff, managed sites, and managed equipment, it's important to remember to review that instructional language on the screen, submit your documentation when it's required for additions or changes, and use the tools and re refer to the on-screen messages that you'll see. Reimbursed and data sharing is another section of the 
profile that I just wanted to touch on briefly. To access the Medicare details form, you will click the edit link adjacent to the listed information, or you would click add new reimbursement information. The Medicare details input form appears for editing or adding reimbursement information. Entering and keeping the reimbursement information up to date in the online portal is crucial for advanced diagnostic imaging facilities. These ADI facilities were affected by the Medicare Improvements for Patients and Providers Act requiring accreditation in order to receive reimbursement for the technical component of their studies from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Certain information, including the NPI and Medicare enrollment numbers, are sent to CMS in the weekly data file transfer. Now, entering your NPI number and your Medicare enrollment number in here also um, allows us to share, do those data file transfers for some private um, insurance reimbursement um, companies. And CMS, when the CMS is sharing with us, it will flag the errors and inconsistencies with the CMS records, which is identified on this slide. You can see it's identified for the users. Okay. Here's a big important link. We're going to turn now to the applications link, which means that we are nearly ready to enter the questionnaire. This slide depicts an account that has an ECHO application in process. The application status is in the middle. You have the checklist and history and some available actions. All of these are very valuable tools. I know there are many watching today that will need to begin their reaccreditation application or also they've received audit notification or notification via email that says that there's correspondence um, available in the portal for you. Well, the little... Um, Available actions icons, there's the one that looks like a mailbox, there's one that looks like a document, and the one I indicated on the top of this slide is the, the wrench. And that relates to those download links that, that we saw just a moment ago under Managed Staff Sites and Equipment. Those of you that are reaccrediting to launch a new application for reaccreditation need to click that little purple circular arrow, and that's um, for your previous, on your previous granted application, and it'll launch your new reaccreditation application so you can get started on it. After proceeding past the confirmation message, when you click that purple arrow, you'll have a new um, application appear in the list, and it will show pending. When your status shows either pro in process or pending, like we just looked at, and there's a green or a blue play button under the available actions. You will click the button to enter the modality specific questionnaire. So we reviewed and updated our account profile sites, staff, and equipment that were entered in the account profile. Now we're ready to complete the questionnaire. Let's take a poll before we do that. I've been talking here for a little bit, and I'll like to know, what is your current comfort level working with an online or web-based system? Do you have a very high level of comfort? Do you have a very high level, a high level? Either you do things, I'll all do things online, or you have an electronic device that you use, or multiple ones. You're neutral, you have a moderate level of comfort. You have a low level of comfort, or you're not at all comfortable. Go ahead and Enter your selection and click Submit. Okay, go ahead and uh, post the next. See? All right. Well, good. We either have most of the majority of you have a high comfort level or you have a moderate level of comfort. So hopefully by the time that we get through with this presentation, you'll feel all very high or high level. So let's go ahead and go into the questionnaire and begin to paint our room. Upon entering the questionnaire, you'll notice this list with the yellow exclamation points and green check marks called the navigation tree. And also on the, on the right side of the screen is the introduction page. And it shows the 
shows the progress box at the top, and some important and helpful information appears on the, uh, below that box. I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the presentation that I would direct you to the support panel when the tab appeared in the questionnaire. So it looks a little bit different. Um, in the profile, it looks like the little triangle in the lower right. In the questionnaire, it looks like this little square tab. And when you click that tab for application support, you'll, you have three options for live help, the FAQ panel, and contact information to, to contact us. No matter what screen you are in the questionnaire, the navigation buttons will appear at the bottom of the screen. These are very important buttons. Clicking any of these buttons saves the work you did on that page. Some of you may be wondering why the previous button is grayed out. It is because you are only able to go back or go previous within a section of the application questionnaire. Also on this slide, I showed a screen capture of an attestation page that has, has a print button. It's only during the attestations or only in that section that you'll see the print button. The standards are literally at your fingertips with our online application. When you click on or hover over the words for a standard, see in the circle there, um, a box will appear and it'll scroll to the correct place in the standards for that application and you can read them and, and review them. So, so far, what we've seen, the questionnaire is a smart application in that you have entered, um, what you have entered into the account profile populates the fields that you will need for the questionnaire. You can monitor your progress, progress excuse me, with the navigation tree and progress box that appears on the introduction and conclusion screens. You'll save your work each session by using the previous, next, and end navigation buttons. The standards are easily accessed by clicking or hovering over the link. Although you can click on sections of the navigation tree, which is on the left, you'll see that again coming up. Um, you can click on those different sections of the navigation tree. We do recommend that you proceed through the application questions from beginning to end, since some of the questions earlier in the questionnaire will impact whether you see or don't see other questions. It kind of turns some questions on or off, depending on how you answer. Also, because your supporting documents are so crucial to the application and the entire accreditation process, with these next couple of slides, I'm going to walk you through the steps to attach file. On this slide is an attachment question without a file attached, and then also one with a successful file upload. The one on the top, of course, is no file is attached there yet, and then on the bottom or in the middle, there is a uh, successfully attached what it looks like. So when you have your document ready and you're, you get to the question that you want to attach it to, click in the spot where it says attach file, then click the browse button, select your file from the dialog window that comes up, and click open. And the bar will appear and show that the file was loading. Sometimes it goes really quick, sometimes it takes a few extra seconds. Upon successful upload, you'll see the green bar and the previously uploaded document link. See right above the Browse button and then right below the Browse button. To verify your file and confirm that you, you have what you wanted in there, you can click the previously uploaded document link and it'll, it'll allow you to open um, the document to see it. So, more attachment information. Our process dictates that all supporting documentation is electronically uploaded to the application questionnaire. You'll need a document scanner to create some of these files. If you don't have a scanner at your facility, you may want to consider obtaining a loaner machine or taking your documents to an office or copy store that can scan them in and provide you with an electronic file to use for uploading. Only one file attachment is allowed per question and you need to use an accepted file type that is 5 megabytes or less in size. Since zip or compressed files is an acceptable format, you may need to zip certain documents together and upload them to one question. If you need help, contact one of our team members. And what do you, what do, you do if you have uploaded an incorrect file and you want to replace it? 
you'll need to repeat the process and upload the, the new file, the new corrected file, to the question. And this essentially erases the old or bad document and replaces it with the new one that you've just uploaded. So we've gotten through our application, the questions. We've attached our files. We get down to the conclusion screen. This is what the conclusion screen will look like when the application is not yet complete. You'll only see the exit button and the in, in the box will be clickable links back to the sections of the questionnaire that need your attention. Completed questionnaire will have all green check marks He's shown here on the, on the left side in the navigation tree, all green check marks. I know that a lot of people get very excited when they have all their green check marks. Um, they'll be present on the left side of the screen and there will be a link for the document cover sheet and the submit button will appear right down there next to that exit button. What you next need to do for the next steps is printing the document cover sheet, reading the instructions, and then click Continue to proceed to the fee estimate screen. The very last step is to finish the checkout process. Just select a payment method and click the final submit button. Okay, so submitting a questionnaire. The submit button will appear on the conclusion screen when all the sections have green check marks and have been completed. Follow the on-screen instructions as well as what is listed in the document cover sheet. Once you submit, the application will be locked and you cannot make changes. You'll be able to view the status and access the questionnaire from the application link in the account profile. All of us here want you to have as pleasant and as efficient an experience with accreditation as possible. We know you are very busy taking care of your patients performing high quality procedures. I hope this presentation has provided you with pertinent knowledge and it helps you feel more confident about the IEC accreditation process. We really cannot express often enough how we are committed to provide you, our clients, with the best customer service. We are here to help. On the screen, I've put our contact information up, and Courtney, I know, is back there, and I have a couple other of my teammates that are ready to help me field some of your questions. So yep. we can and so that going to lead us into the Q&A session. So again, participants may submit questions using the Q&A panel on the lower left-hand corner of the screen if you haven't already submitted a question yet. And I think Lysha has your first question, Linda. Okay. Oh, okay. I will have the first question. <laughs> How soon <laughs> after we... <laughs> Sorry about that. How soon after we are granted accreditation can we start editing our application? How soon after you're granted can you start editing? Well, the, the, the application that you submitted is locked, so you're not going to be able to edit that one. But you can upload, as I was showing with the, the little purple arrow, you can upload your reaccreditation application as soon as being right after you're um, granted. But we we generally recommend that you don't start editing until a year or so out. You know, if you wanted to, to look at it and touch your application questionnaire, you certainly can upload it, launch it, and, and look at it and review it two years out. But um, generally the rule of thumb is, is one year out, go ahead and click the purple button. Let me see, I'm trying to get the, um, the slide that has that purple button on it. I'll put that up there for you, Courtney, and maybe. Would you uh, like the me button? To no, the button only uh, the button becomes available after you're granted. Okay. Maybe Lysha or uh, Cindy can get that purple button up there for me. There we go. All right, so next question. Uh, I have a question here from Debbie. She says, when changing staff information, should staff who have left the organization be deleted or just noted as inactive? Ah, that's a good question, Debbie. 
you are not going to be able to delete any information that's entered into the profile. You can only deactivate. Um, so you would deactivate a person, and depending on who the person is, if it's the technical director or the medical director, will need notification, uh, written notification that, of that change. And our policies are all posted on, on all of the websites, and you can... When you're in your, your uh, account, you can also link to certain policies and certain forms that you would need to notify us. I have another question here from Colleen who asks, if we have a new physician coming and they are right out of training, do we have to document their CMEs for the past year? That's a good question. And... They're, if they're right out of training, depending on the modality, certain modalities require, let me, let me back up there with that. Um, most of our modalities allow new employees, new staff, and staff that are recently graduated or recently certified to use that newness and recent certification as their continuing education. What you need to do is enter the continuing education or the certification as a, in the course name in the continuing education panel. Uh, looks like Lysha got the, the purple arrow up there for the reaccreditation question, but we're going to put up now the, um, the continuing education panel. Let me just show that to you. Bear with me here. Edit staff. Okay. So here's the continuing education. And see on the, the far left there where it says course or exam name? If you have a recent graduate or that has a recent certification, you'll put the exam, whatever exam it was. I know, for example, uh, a CBNC, you know, nuclear physicians take the CBNC. You could enter that in there as a course exam name, um, and I would I would say to you know when it's an exam like that, go ahead and put fifteen for the the hours. Next question. I have a question from Laurie. Who? Oh, and I just lost her question. Uh, I have a question from Steve, who says, "Can I edit any and all PDF and Microsoft Word documents after I upload them online?" Steve, you are not able to edit them after they're uploaded. You can you can copy over them as I was describing. You know, you can change the, the file. So any of the files that you've uploaded before you submit, yes, you can you can change the upload. I have a question from Sarah who says, what about documents that have been signed, such as correlations? Do they need to be scanned in as an image and then uploaded? Um, the, the, the individual team, the correlations, if you're referring to vascular, the, the individual team members would be able to answer that question a little bit better than I would. But if you have a file with the correlations that's electronic that hasn't been signed, more often than not, and we can confirm this with the, the different teams, uh, I'm pretty sure that there's some vascular people on the line, and my my partners, my teammates here can kind of speak to it as well. Um, but we don't necessarily require the signed document, except when we're talking about certain legal forms like the attestations and the uh, agreement. We need original. We need signatures. So if it's a if it's a policy or protocol that you're uploading or the correlations, it doesn't necessarily have to be scanned in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer to the, the team to get to the specifics with that. They would easily be able to answer that question. I have a question here from Michael who asks, IACCs are the same for each modality? Can you repeat the question, Courtney? He would like to know if IACCs are the same for each modality. No, the fees are different for the different modalities. Um, 
the fee schedules are on all of the websites. Um, there's a fee calculator that, that you could use on a website. Um, and the fees obviously come up at the end when you're at the, the point of submitting. Um, I have a question from Brenda who asks, how do you know for sure that your document has been attached? Some of mine look like they were attached, but IAC said they didn't get them. Hmm. Okay. Um, if it's attached, and it looks like attached, when you go into the previously uploaded document link, you should be able to see the document exactly as you intended it. So if you click the link and you review it and, and see it and see the document there, then what you see is what we should see. If you see something that's missing pages or not, not there, you cannot click the previously uploaded document link, then something may not be correct. Um, again, I would, I would refer to the, the, the team. Um, they can explain a little bit further if, if something was not what they were expecting. Usually there's generally a, a good description with that question that says what, what they're expecting, and you can refer to the standard link too as, to see what, what is needed with that particular document. I have a question from Debbie who asks, can you print the online application? Hi, Debbie. You cannot print it per se from the questionnaire. You can't print the whole thing as you see it on the screen. You would go to the, the uh, applications link in the profile. And uh, let's see if Leisha or Cindy can get that slide up for me. Um, you go to the Applications link, and in the Available Actions, there is the wrench, the red wrench, and it allows you to download. This is what I was referring to earlier in the presentation. You can download the Continuing Education list. You can download the application questions in a spreadsheet format. So it, it's very simplified, and it has the, the questions as you were answering them. Um, but that's what you can print out. You can do that I for your have... previous application or the one that you're working on. Go ahead. All right. Uh, I've got a question here from Michael who asked, how do you submit case studies? Oh, my goodness, a million-dollar question. Submitting case studies. Um, the case studies are not attached to the online application at this point in time. They are submitted on discs, on CDs, two copies. I, I'm getting a little help from my, my teammate here, Cindy. You're going to submit um, two copies, two sets of CDs with, with your patient case studies on it. Um, refer to the, the website for the, the types of case studies and the content of what should be on that CD. And you do need to include, if it doesn't have come with it, you need to include the, the viewer in order for somebody, one of our reviewers, to take that disk and put it in their computer and be able to view your study. I have a, a question here from Renee who says, our department has downsized and there is only one full-time registered sonographer. What are the implications for reaccreditation? That is going to have to go to the ECHO folks. They, they would be able to help with a very specific clinical question such as that. We have, um, I don't know if everybody was in on the poll, but earlier we, we posted the poll, and we have all, all different modalities on today. And some of, the, some of your questions, although all of the questions are very good, um, really are, are specific to the modality that you are related to. So you need to look at standards and you need to um, follow up with, with our staff. I have a general question here um, from Catherine. She says, if you cannot attach a file, do you just mail information to IAC? Oh, thank you, Catherine, for asking that question. No. 
you do not mail us anything. It needs to be attached to the online application. You're not going to be able to submit unless there is attachment in place. And please do not um, upload something <laughs> there just to have something there because um, they really need, they being the staff, the reviewers, everybody in the process needs to have the upload and the, the electronic file present in the application. Um, the only time that something would need to be sent in is if it's requested specifically from um, a team member that says, we need this, you know, something different, something outside of your application that was missing that is follow-up materials. All right, I have a question from Jody. She asked, where do we find the information on what case studies are needed for accreditation? That would go to the website. Um, just, uh, you just see if I can direct you exactly to where, what place on the website. Where are my marketing people? There, I know they're on, and Courtney's one of them. Um, let me just tell you. What are you looking for? I know the case study to to see and to read about the case studies. Not only is let me let me tell them this first. Not only is it present in every one of the applications, it has modality specific case study information. When you get to that point in the questionnaire, it will tell you this is what you need for case studies. And it, the the questionnaire also has the fields, the specific fields. If you need a certain number of case studies or a certain type of case studies, it will prompt you or it will say, okay, this is where you need to put this case study in or select from this list which type of case study it is. So when you're ready to apply for reaccreditation, there is, and any of the, the different uh, the sites, the one that you're currently accredited or ready to apply, there's a, there's a link that says preparing your application in the left-hand sidebar, and then underneath how to prepare, it says case studies. So if you were going to the echo or vascular or nuclear website, you would go to preparing your application, and then it says case studies. And there is detailed information about what case studies you'll need. And also, when we were looking at the, um, the checklist, um, the checklist information has a lot of very detailed and very specific information that's, that's great to help you with preparing your application and preparing for submission. All right. question, Courtney. I have a question from Lori who says, can you download the CME list for staff instead of entering the CMEs individually under manage staff? The CMEs need to be entered individually under manage staff um, for the, each individual staff member. We do not at this time have, have a different way of doing it, but the, the CMEs, again, that information gets to the reviewers and gets to the people that need to see it here in-house, in and um, they do need to be entered individually. I have a question from Sue who, said, who asked, will this is this process all electronic? Is there absolutely no paperwork involved? <laughs> Physical paper. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the process is online. It's a web-based system. It is done on the web. Um, there's minimal paperwork involved. Uh, you have to submit your case studies. You have to submit attestations and the accreditation agreement, which is a legal document concerning ownership of the accreditation. So all of those are important pieces of information, important documents that are generally submitted hard copy. Uh, Kathy asks, will we still mail final interpreted reports and images, or will they be uploaded also? Final reports are uploaded to the online accreditation questionnaire. All right, let me just scroll through here. Uh, 
Michael asks, can you submit your application offline? No. Your application must be submitted online. You must use the online accreditation portal and submit your questionnaire as we reviewed it today. Um, Sylvia asks, are my CME updates valid even though I haven't started my renewal? Sylvia. Um, perhaps Sylvia can clarify her question. Can you re repeat it for me, Courtney? Uh, I just scrolled away from it. <laughs> um, let me, we'll come back to Sylvia's question. Let me ask a question from Kim who asked, in our last application, the reviewers were unable to view the MPI images we submitted for our case studies. I was wondering if others had this problem and I'm looking for suggestions on resolving this issue. I am going to refer Kim to, I don't know what modality. Oh. I I'm, I'm suspect that she's probably nuclear and she's looking for suggestions on uploading her case studies. The team, the teams really, the specific um, modality teams here at, at ISC are really able to help you the best with this. Um, if there's, you can't, if, if you're a person, you if you put the disk in, a computer other than the one attached to the machine that you, you got it from, um, and you're not able to review the study, then there's a good chance that they're not the re our reviewers are not going to be able to review the study. So that's that's key. You know, make sure that you have um, the files in, in in a way where the reviewers would be able to review them. I have a question from Tammy, and she says, we are told we cannot send patient images online since this is a HIPAA violation. Do we put them on a disk and mail instead? Well, um, repeat the question, Courtney. Um, she, Tammy says, we are told we cannot send patient images online since this is a HIPAA violation. And can they send them, put them on a disk and send them to you instead? Okay. Well, it's, it's not a HIPAA violation to, to enter the information into this secure um, online application. And the cases are sent in on disk, so they are, they are mailed. So I'm not sure what Tammy's... Um, if Tammy could clarify as far as what, what her concern was about being a HIPAA violation. It's, it's not a HIPAA violation to, to enter the information into the, our online questionnaire um, or send the CDs in. Okay, and I have a question here that asks, can we adopt and use IAC sample policies without modifying them? Without modifying them? No, um, you you can, but you will not. Um, you will probably result in a delay. You you need to to take the policies, their samples, and customize them to your your facility. Um, put your facility name on them. Put enter the information that's appropriate for your facility as far as the the protocol. You know, how do you do it at your facility? That's what applying for accreditation is about. I have a question from Sue. She says, what about com the completed worksheets that are part of the case study? How do you upload the worksheet if it's in the patient's electronic chart? How do you, how do you upload a worksheet if it's part of a patient's electronic chart. Um, they'll have to print it and either scan it in or create a PDF file in order to, to include it on the CD with the patient's case. And that Constance. goes for reports as well. Uh, uh, Courtney, we'll take a few more questions. This was a, I know that it said in some places that the, the time was going to be a, a whole hour but we were going to run for about 45 minutes or so. We'll take some more questions as I know that there's quite a few still out there. Okay, 
go ahead and write one from Constance who says, can I start any time for the education of doctor and text entries to save time later? I think I understand what Constance is asking. Okay. Can, you, can you, yes, you can, you can go into your, your account profile and you can, you can work on the continuing education. You can enter that at any time. That is actually designed to be a, a way of tracking continuing education. So you can post it there, enter it there, you know, between cycles, between one accreditation and, and the next. And it will stay there. It's not going to go away. Next question, Courtney. Um, I see one. Janet is asking, for multiple users, do you have one password for each user? And Cindy helped Janet out. And she said, each user will have their own user ID and its own unique password. Um, and Brittany was also asking very similarly to what Constance was saying, you know, how far in advance can you start working on reaccreditation? Um, how, when can you, you work in, in the, the profile? I, I, I really recommend to everybody out there, if you haven't looked at your, your account, go in, access your account, take a look at it. It's not going to hurt anything to touch the account and to, to work in the account and look at it, review it, update it. Um, you might see something that needs to be addressed, and that would be great. You know, you can get that done now rather than later. Um, those of you that are, that are working in your questionnaires, you know, again, it's not, it's not going to hurt anything to open the questionnaire. You can attach a couple policies or protocols today and then close it. You got some patients that you got to do. You can come back to it next week or a better day um, in time. All right. We well, is it question? okay if this is the last, the final question? Sure. No, all right. This is from Carla, and she says, since I am taking over for someone else, how can I see what documents have previously been submitted? For example, policies and procedures, procedures, et cetera. Carla, you will go to, let me, let me get it up there for us so we can talk about it. You'll go to your um, applications link in the profile. And you'll go to the wrench, the red wrench under Available Actions. Next to that application, you'll click on it, and you can see what the, the person had done previously. And this is where you can download and print the, the documents, or you can actually go and look at the questionnaire if it was done online. If it wasn't done online and you have um, an older version that was, previously mailed in, um, the process is a little bit different. But if you go online and you uh, click on the, the wrench or click a, into your the lock button, see down on, at that vascular application on the bottom of the screen right now, it has a little lock button. You can click on that lock and you can see the questionnaire and see how all the questions were answered previously in order to prepare for the um, reaccreditation that you're going to be working on. And, and I actually have one more question from Beth, and she okay. says, for reaccreditation, do you contact us or do we start the process on our own online? We generally suspend a year in advance and then a couple points in between a year and the expiration date. That's we'll also send you one in six months postcard, in advance. Right. We'll send you a postcard. Yeah. So a year out, we, we, we send you a message that says, hey, you know, it's coming around for time for reaccreditation. You might want to get in there and take a look. But with that knowledge, I mean, we'll send you a notification or a little reminder at, at one year and six months. I'll send you a postcard. You can go in any time. You can go in if you, if you don't know. If you, were, if you were brand new to a particular facility and you think that they were they just got granted accreditation, you know, six months, a year ago, go in and take a look. And if you look at the history, see the history button uh, uh, below these, you could see when it expires, when that application expires, 
And so you can you can tell or you have an idea of when would be appropriate time to start your reaccreditation application. All right. So then we're, we're going to wrap, wrap up the Q&A sec section of this webinar. And if you have any questions that were not answered, which is we have quite a few that we didn't get to, unfortunately. Um, but if you go and look at the contact IAC slide here, if you will email your questions to the proper email address, your question will be answered. Uh, when the session ends, you will be directed to a survey. Uh, if you please would please com complete the survey, we would greatly appreciate it. And this concludes the webinar. So thank you, Linda, for presenting today. And thank you to everyone who joined us. We appreciate your participation.